Tas, 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 tas. Tas, 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 tas. Test, test, test. Is this working? Yeah, I can hear you. You can hear it? It's just lighter. It's switched, but as long as you can hear me. Okay, that does work. And then you hit go live. Let me see if it's... Uh, yeah, yeah, it looks like we're streaming. Let me uh, just check our YouTube studio. Let's check our go live. Oh, it looks like it's live right now. Sweet. And let's see here. Yeah, yeah, we're live. Okay. Oh, and it looks like I am Johnny Pets as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's annoying that change that they've made. Yeah, it, it definitely did not do that before. No. James Gorelli, say, okay. And I mean, we can just do the quick intro, but go ahead and go if you want. <laughs> Let's go for it. One, oh, just yawned. Not <laughs> like I've just been crying before we went. Yeah, live. make sure I don't have any cruddies <laughs> in my face here or anything. Let's see. Right then. So, hello everyone, and welcome back to the Red YouTube channel and to a returning episode of the Solitary series of me, Jonathan Petz. Once again, I'm joined by the awesome Clay Reed and James Lucarelli. Hey guys, how you doing? Doing great. Thank you for joining us again, and thank you to everyone watching live again and after the fact on YouTube. Um, so today is kind of a part two to the last session. Obviously, James uh, introduced us, and we all discussed the world of ISO, and hopefully broke down some barriers and helped you guys understand how to really utilize the ISO to gain in areas of highlight detail, shadow detail, and really learn how to use ISO to get the most out of your RED camera. And a big part of that, um, you know, was talking about noise and the different types and how it impacts your image. And, you know, one of the common questions we get is ISO and what is black shading? So in today's session, we're going to be breaking that down, looking at, you know, what is black shading? Um, why do reds need black shading when my other camera does not need black shading? And, you know, what are the benefits to black shading? Um, you know, what happens during a black shading? What is it actually doing when I'm initiating this process? And when should I consider it? And how should I do it? You know, uh, things like temperature, uh, exposure changes, firmware updates, or, you know, is there challenging shots that I should be considering it with? Or what if I'm in an extreme condition? All these kind of things that play into when you should do it to ultimately benefit your image, as we discussed in the ISO session, reduce a certain type of noise. Um, we'll, we'll then start to look at, is it camera specific and sensor specific? What are the different types of auto manual black shading and the ultimate differences between Ranger, DSMC2 and Komodo? Um, we'll then look at black shading for some specialty situations, you know, those extreme situations, underwater housings, shot over housings, covers, those kind of things. And as we always do, we'll then go into a Q and A. Um, so lots to go over in this session and obviously very looking forward to breaking it down for you guys. Uh, and I reckon we'll, we'll kind of start tackling it. Um, so I, th I think the first question we had was, um, you know, what is black shading and why do I really need to do it? And, you know, well, unlike other camera systems, RED doesn't do any sort of image sharpening or noise reduction, skin softening or anything like this, you know, the aim is to give you as raw of an image as possible, giving you ultimate flexibility and future-proofing your work. You know, one of the things myself and James were just discussing before the stream started was, hey, the RED1 can use IPP2 because it's a completely raw image. Other camera systems can't do that. Once you've shot, that media is baked in, that metadata is baked in. Good luck updating to that camera's latest build, you know? And, and, and on that same note of capturing, oops, why are we getting a... Are you hearing the echo? Oh, oh, sorry. Is that from me? Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I, I, there's a bad echo, and I, we'll, we'll get that f figured out. But the one thing we, we would want to do is when we were capturing, whether it was Red 1 all the way up to Komodo, we would want to make sure that we did that black shade beforehand, right? Because if you captured it, and I'm going to show you an example here where maybe you did capture it, and you didn't do it with the maybe with the lens cap all the way on, or maybe with a lens cap that didn't have this clearly placed white logo here, that is in your footage, right? That is not something that you're gonna be able to bring back. 
And really, it's definitely something when we're talking about having the cleanest overall image here, that's what's going to allow you to do that, is ensuring that you did take the time to do that proper black shade, to make sure that no additional light was in there, and that all of your sensor had that, that, that clean, uniform black shade map. I mean, yeah, I mean, essentially what, what, what we're saying when we say do a black shade is basically what, what's the reason why we're black shading is in certain situations, you get what's called fixed pattern noise. Um, this can be influenced by te temperature fluctuations in temperature due to your environment. And we're doing this to ensure clean and consistent pixel sensitivity across the image by basically calibrating all of the analog to digital converters. And then essentially with that information, subtracting a master dark frame at that temperature, at that exposure time, um, to remove any of those fixed pattern uh, noise artifacts that we're seeing. Uh, and this essentially makes sure your image is as dark as possible, um, you know, once that temperature is leveled off, which is what we'll discuss as to when you should black shade a little bit later on. Um, but, you know, one source of this fixed pattern noise can be from non-uniformity compensation or NUC. Um, that, uh, you know, non-uniformity compensation terms that are applied to pixels in the array. You know, NUC is, a, I'm just reading this here. I, I think yeah. Graham told it to me. <laughs> NUC is a process whereby a series of uniform but noisy frames are averaged to a calculation of an offset correction table. Uh, the resulting offsets are applied to each pixel in the array to adjust their response with respect to other pixels. If the number of frames is not enough to average out the noise present in the video, some residual noise is basically burned into the table. This is why the patterns don't move. And as we'll see in this image that we'll have overlaid, you can be panning, but you'll have that fixed. And, 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 and as James showed, I mean, James, if you, if you, if you want to show yeah. that again, James took the lens cap off and that data is burned in. So you're panning around the image, moving around the image that is staying there because, you know, it's been burnt into the calibration in the camera. That's what you've told it is normal. Even though this is a do not do this kind of situation, this is what became normal in that situation. Um, and, and you can see there is the cause of that right there. There's that red sticker right clearly there. And even this, that's the front cap on the lens. I would say use the body cap. That way you don't have any potential risk of someone coming over and pulling that off slightly and going, oh, is this mine? You know, my lens here. I mean, this, then, this, this is a good discussion topic, James, because people always kind of come to us and go, should I take the lens off? Should I not? And best practice technically should be put the port cap on because you're reducing a variable where if you leave the lens on, that's fine as long as you cover it, you know, maybe with with, uh, with, with uh, I don't know, cloth or something yeah. to ensure no light can get in. But you run the chance of an AC or someone coming over and pulling a cap off. So then you know the lens is off, we're calibrating, but you can leave the lens on just to ensure you're covering areas of potential light leak and that lens cap is on tightly, it's covered. So, you know, two, two, two different ways, but you can ultimately achieve the same thing as long as everyone on the camera team is aware. And, and, and on one man shoots, do I take that time? No, because I'm the only one in here. But when we are on set and we are going to lunch and this is a good time to do it, right? Because we've been shooting and the temperature may be changing and we're going to take 15 minutes or maybe an hour for lunch. Great time to do a black shade. Um, manual is going to take a lot, um, a lot less time. Um, but this actually was on a Gemini. And remember with Gemini, you do have two passes. So I would plan accordingly because it can take up to a full hour. If you're doing auto, I would not recommend doing auto. I would do a manual for time consideration purposes. Which as is well. something we'll, we'll get onto a little bit later, but, but, but just to kind of wrap up here with, with, with what is black shading, you know, the process is mapping out those lines or lit pixels, which is caused by a particular pixel or kind of fixed pattern noise kind of being occurred in that. And that's why it appears fixed. Um, so, you know, this is impacted by temperature and integration time or your exposure time um, to produce a uniform noise profile over the entire image. And I think it'd be great, James, now if, if you kind of went into, you know, how do we correctly do one? What, what are those kind of steps to starting us doing black shading? Mm -hmm. and, and those steps would be essentially, you're gonna want to essentially get your camera out, 
get it turned on. Notice I'm not doing this directly out of, bat, bat, out of the camera bag or box or wherever you're coming from the Pelican and doing this right off the bat. This is also something where Johnny and I were talking about this too. If we know the shoot is gonna be in a different environment, don't necessarily try and hedge your bet or turn up your AC or turn down your AC really cold to try and get it prepared for tomorrow's shoot. The best thing to do is get into that environment, let the camera boot up about, you know, five to 10 minutes would be, should be sufficient. You know, I, I'm looking for a recommendation. I here. mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, one of the things that, I mean, we'll have some images here, obviously, but you, there, there, there is temperature information on the camera, which gives you the temperature. And essentially when you see that number stop rising, when you turn it on, the body will be cold, you know, black shading then won't be useful. But when you see that number level off, you know, uh, I'm trying to think what the temperature levels off at uh, on, on the camera, but when the temperature levels off at 44 degrees or whatever it is, um, then you know, ah, it's not rising. I can now do my black shade. I, I would still say that, you know, it is something where we might be in that cold environment, so it may never get to there. I would say this is not something that we do directly out of the bag. Let it boot up. Let it be for a couple of minutes, right? Komodo is going to be less because it is a newer camera. It boots up a little bit quicker. Also, it gets smaller. <laughs> it's smaller. Great point, right? It physically is smaller, so there's less to boot up there uh, and, and heat up to that homeostasis temperature. But yes, that is the one thing that we would want to do. And then the other thing to keep in mind here is we talked about temperature. Let's also talk about exposure time. So exposure time is essentially frame rate and shutter. So as we change our frame rate, as we change our shutter, this is not something where I would say do our black shade and then switch over to our high frame rate shoot mode. No, that's when we should do that black shade in that mode with that shutter angle or with that degree that we want to shoot because that is going to be something that's going to dictate this. So major temperature swings, I would say plus or minus uh, 30 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Celsius yeah. and uh, exposure changes of greater than a half second. So that would be your one over 180 to something like a, a 90 degree or a 45 degree or something like, uh, it was, you know, it's like was it like from like 50th to like one eighth or, or one eight thousandth of a second if you're thinking photography terms? I mean, it, exposure time it's pretty wide, you know. On the modern cameras, you can get away going to you know any kind of shutter angle you, you, you realistically shoot with, um, and frame rate rise, you know, you can go up to you know 120 or, or 200 or or slow down to you know. 22 off speed it's when you start going to one fps that's mm -hmm. where you'll want to start considering it if you're doing time lapses or something like that and you can see it right now on my camera it's both green the t and the e are both green but notice here i'm not even going to guess notice it just turned yellow there so your e at the bottom of your screen your exposure time is going to tell you when you start to drift outside of that i will say my rule of thumb is anything 72 frames per second or less right that's my traditional or not too far off of my one over 48 or maybe my one over 140 what are we saying here right one over 48 up to one over 50 maybe up to one over 200 okay that's when i would probably go ahead and do a different black shade and this is something where we'll talk about it a little bit more here if you're in the yellow you're in the middle of a shot i probably wouldn't stop the shot and do a black shade if this is something that this is drastically different maybe 300 frames per second from the 24 you were shooting or 35 degrees off from where you previously were shooting and it's only going to get colder or farther away yes take the time to go ahead and do that black shade um it's going to take a few minutes for komodo and maybe about 15 minutes for your dsm i mean, I mean yeah i mean that you know the, the the camera will tell you when it's deviated from its its base you know we've we've got the green the yellow and the red indicated with a plus and a minus and if you get a yellow plus for example that means that the temperature is over what it is expecting if it's a minus it is below what it is expecting from that original calibration map of the temperature that you set so you know as james said you could be recording or, or no well a good use case is you take the camera out at the start of the day you turn it on it's going to say t minus the temperature is below the calibration map that we set so then as it gets up it will then eventually then go to green and then if it then ends up getting hotter it will then go from t minus to green to then t plus and you know ah this is a little bit over kind of what i was expecting so um mm -hmm. you know and also it depends on the situation you're in if you're shooting a very very bright scenario and it goes t plus you'll probably be okay for a little bit it'd be great if you could do it but you'll probably be okay but if you're shooting super low light it's very very dark and it goes t plus 
maybe starts to go red, you should really be considering it because low light is where we notice noise a lot more, which is what we learned in the last episode where, hey, you know, we're shooting in a bright situation. The effects of noise are not going to be as, uh, as apparent, whereas low light is where it is. So it's definitely low light we need to consider black shading traditionally a little bit more. And, and definitely something that we'll, we'll lean on Graham's uh, feedback on, right? We, you were just referencing there, right? Remember noise was that low cost, but if you have a very low value, it's a lot more apparent. If we're feeding it a lot of light and then it's still that low cost, um, yes, it's gonna be less in your face. So that, that challenging shot um, is, is definitely something where I would be a little bit more cognizant of, hey, which direction is this going? Is it only getting cooler? Is it only going to get worse? Yeah, we should probably go ahead and stop the shoot. Once again, 15 minutes here, guys, guys and gals, a few minutes to ensure that your image is gonna be clean going forward. I think there's a couple of recent films that are out now where maybe there's a pixel that was there or something that had been cleaned up by a black shade. And really, if you would have taken the time to do that, that would have been something that uh, you would have had that much cleaner results. I mean, I mean, I think this is probably a good, a good place to, to go, James, where, you know, do, do you want to explain the difference between an auto and, and a manual? Because obviously on the yep. SMC2 and Ranger, you can you can choose the type of black shade that you're doing. Yep. So on the... On DSMC2 and Ranger, great point there, Johnny. That is a larger system. It does have more dedicated boards and storage there. You can have several calibration maps on there. It's not something where I would have a list of them, and it's definitely never something where I would want to migrate them from one camera to the other, but it is something where I can know, okay, in this shoot, we're gonna shoot 24 frames per second or one over 48, and then we're also gonna do some high frame rate or maybe also a cool time lapse. Those are three very different shutter angles there, and I can save up to about four on my DSMC2 camera, and that way it'll keep me to not have to do that in between the middle of my shoot. That is also on a manual calibration, right? An automatic calibration is something that we introduced with our DSMC2 cameras where essentially the camera goes through and it does a calibration map from everything from one over eight to one over 8,000 on your shutter angle. For someone like myself that uses shutter pretty pr pretty flexibly outside, um, it's definitely something that I like to keep on my camera. But once again, I'm doing that oftentimes for demo purposes, or maybe once again, I'm outside where I don't have to worry about flicker and lights and things like that. So I may use an auto black shade on my camera personally, but remember my exposure strategy also leans things a little bit to the right. I'm not where I'm constantly bumping down into that low light scenario there where my noise floor might creep up. I would say when I do shoot in those situations, when we are doing that early morning shoot, I don't shoot in auto. I do take the time to do a manual. And that's when I go ahead and get the best results because once again, I'm no longer in a demo purpose. I'm no longer needing that flexibility of having the auto calibration. Students, faculty, teachers, great time to utilize that. No, we're gonna actually do a test here where we want this to look the best for all time. Do that manual calibration. And that's what we're gonna recommend for all of our cameras with the exception of the Dragon Sense. No, yeah, I mean, I mean, really, you know, it was, it was auto came from DSMC1 and the Dragon Sensor. And because we've got the Dragon Sensor in DSMC2, that's kind of where that came from. So, you know, manual is quicker than auto for Monstro, Helium, Gemini, uh, and obviously the uh, new kill on the block Komodo. Uh, and then your auto traditionally for Dragon takes a bit longer, uh, but, but you obviously cover that, that kind of wider base. Now, you we don't suggest doing a manual on Dragon X. If you've got a DSMC2, you should be doing the auto because of the legacy nature of that sensor but you know if you're on set manual is very very quick anyway relatively speaking especially on komodo it's a couple of minutes um so it's something that can be it benefits you image image quality wise and all those kind of things um and obviously at some point we'll mention why we do it and nobody else does i think that'll be yeah. a question that will come up um and, and the other thing to keep in mind here too is with the auto we said it earlier and I just want to restate again, Gemini does do two full passes. So when I did the auto on this, plan for it taking over an hour, it will warn you that it's going to take over an hour and it's not something that you want to go ahead and stop midway through. So plan accordingly. You, you, you would not want to have a half done black shade. In and and also Gemini needs it for its low light and its standard mode as well. So if, if you're doing a night shoot and you're bouncing between sand and low light, you should be black shading for both because you are fundamentally changing how the sensor is capturing that light as we've discussed um, previously 
uh, on, on these sessions. And we're not gonna probably use this example because it's not the greatest, but here's where you can see where I did a manual pass with that bad uh, image on my lens cap. And then you can see there on the stand, on the low light version, it's completely clean. So it, it does require two full passes. And uh, yeah, definitely something where you would wanna take the time to go ahead and do so. Um, so other bits we've got in here. Um, um, the, 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 I think this is where we would talk about the challenging situations, right? Or yeah. I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously we've got to expand on some of these bits anyway, but I mean, I mean, this leads us quite nicely into situations that are a bit tricky, you know, really hot environments, very cold environments. You know, James does a lot of underwater filmmaking. So, you know, how do you black shade for an environment that you either can't get into because of the underwater housing or because you don't want to because it's really hot or really cold outside. And I mean, James, mm -hmm. I mean, because you shoot a lot of underwater stuff, what what, what, what do you do when you're planning to, to go underwater? Well, I, I think in all of these scenarios, having a test day or a prep day helps, right? Because then you can actually go out and maybe go out the day before and get a chance to do this. The thing about the water housings are is once they're in the water, typically the water is the heat sink that keeps the camera cool. It will get hotter when you start swimming with it above the surface. So how are you swimming with that water housing? For myself, if it is a black housing, and I'll have the Komodo housing here, it is a black housing. If I do plan on swimming with it above the surface, right, not doing dolphins or you know shallow submerged stuff, I will put the camera in that black housing, maybe not close it completely, stick it outside, let it get warm to that homeostasis. Why? Because that's the environment it's going to be in, right? It's, it's, I, I don't want it to feel all the coolness that it will get from being outside in the normal ambient air. I want it to kind of get that hotter temperature, never to be something that's outside of our operating range. I want to be clear here, right? You don't ever want to starve your camera of oxygen, but what that might allow me to do is set a target temperature of maybe 40 degrees rather than 35 degrees, right? Yeah, because the thing here is that when you black shade, it's at the temperature it's currently at. So Correct. if you do it outside of it and then put it in the housing, it's going to be, it's going to get incorrect very, very quickly. And, and, and that fan could be going at 200 or not, it can't go at 200%, but it can be going at its fastest percentage and it will never get back to that target temperature. So that's where, you know, either starting it with a higher temperature, if we do know it's going to be a little bit higher or maybe hedging that a little bit lower if we know the camera's never gonna get quite up to 35, right? 32 degrees. Um, I will say we wanna know the ranges that we're gonna recommend here. I wanna say openly, I think it's right in between 30 and 45 degrees and we'll check the ops guys on that. Um, when you get a camera brand new, it's gonna default to, I wanna say 35, is that correct? And we'll, we'll, we'll double I, check. I can't my head, yeah. But, but we'll double check that that's what it is. And, and once again, that's your five degree or so leeway window there, where depending if I'm gonna go shoot to the snow tomorrow, or if I'm gonna go back into that water housing, once again, I don't do it now, I'm gonna go and get to that environment, get that camera in, in that homeostasis where it's booted up, my T and my E have, have leveled out, and that's when I'm gonna go ahead and start that black shade. No, I mean, I mean, I mean, obviously that, that when you can do it, absolutely perfect, but obviously, you know, in situations where maybe it's freezing outside, it's it's minus, you know, a couple of degrees Fahrenheit or, my, or minus a couple of degrees Celsius, you know, what can we really do? And obviously by changing that fan speed, you know, either, you know, having the fans kick in sooner to drive a temperature down or have the fans kick in a little bit later and allowing that camera to get a little bit hotter can help us get closer towards that target temperature. So, you know, if we're mm -hmm. working in a very hot environment, you know, allowing the fans to kick in at a later temperature to let it mm -hmm. get up to that heat. Because, you know, if we try and, you know, black shade to 40 degrees and we know it's going to be, you know, 115 degrees Fahrenheit outside, the camera is never going to get close to that number. So by setting it a little bit higher, it'll be a bit more of a reasonable number for the camera to reach to. And likewise, if it's colder, having the fans come on, you know, a little bit later, or, you know, all those kind of things to balance it to where that temperature will end up sitting can help you get there a little bit before if you don't want to step out into that snow just yet. And, and this is definitely something where, you, you know, what can you do? Can we open the tent, right, before we go all the way out? Can we do this at base camp before we climb Everest? Um, there are ways to do this without putting your camera in the refrigerator or the oven. We definitely don't recommend those things, but um, it, 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 it's always something where, um, you, you would never want to um, 
you know, I, I mean, I, I do think with, uh, with both DSMC2 Ranger and Komodo, really for best results, get their plan accordingly. And, and it's worth saying with Komodo, we're talking three minutes, right? If you don't have three minutes to do a proper black shade, uh, we're basically just pulling the lens and trying to F8 and be there anyways, right? So let's not worry about getting the proper black shade there. You're, you're, you're on pretty much a run and gun shoot as is if you don't have three minutes for prep. I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, we, we recommend the default target temperature for most shooting scenarios. That way, you know, you're covered. Um, but when you, when you turn the camera on, um, the target temperature is the temperature from the calibration map, regardless of where your temperature was when you last turned it on. So maybe you had a target temperature, you went high, you turn the camera off, the target temperature will remain at the one that the calibration is currently set. And when you make a new calibration, the target temperature will then change. And by, as James said, you can save multiple calibration files. You're basically setting different kind of target temperatures for the different environments that you may or may not have. Um, and this is done to avoid any image quality problems when rebooting. Um, the calibration will take priority due to the close represent the, the close relationship of it with image quality. Um, and you know the intent of target temperature is to set the sensor temperature so that you can create a calibration map for that temperature. Um, I think probably having some overlays of going into menus and seeing how we set and change all of those things will help people. I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. No. And and we'll show them in the menus. I'm just trying to talk out loud here and think of what else we could show here. Um, I know yeah, the question. I mean, I mean, yeah, I think up. it's going through on both cameras, just showing where target temperature and fan speed is on DSMC2 on Komodo. You haven't got that, but showing where you go to do a black shade and a, and a, and a balance and those kind of things. So right above James's finger right here, you can see that T and that E right there. We're going to show something better than this, but at least showing you live that you can see right where that is. And if I did want to get a little bit better focus here and punch in on that Komodo right here, you're going to see that uh, right there as well. Mm -hmm. You can see that right there. And notice as we change our shutter. Yeah, and now it's got E because it's off from that initial calibration. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, should we, should we stop this one here and then? We stop this one here. I think the one thing we didn't really cover, and I, 